Good afternoon, and welcome to another uh, in our series of comparative religious classes. The last couple of months, really, we've been looking at all of the various aspects of Christianity, from the origins of the Christian church and following through the development of this religion as it began to spread through the Middle East and up into Europe, and of course has now spread worldwide over the last 2,000 years. We have uh, looked at the development of the theology of the church. Uh, We've particularly looked at how the Roman Catholic Church began and became structured. We had the opportunity to look through the various aspects of the Protestant Reformation with Martin Luther and John Calvin and many of the other reformers that began all kinds of new religious movements. Since the time of the Reformation, we've had a chance to look at several different denominations within Christianity, how they develop their core beliefs, their practices, and we've begun to see a lot of new movements that have developed out of Christianity, some of them keeping very much within the context of historic Christian theology, some other groups that have developed along the way that have taken off on another tangent and have begun to develop other understandings and other ideas about the faith. Well, we finished up with uh, the last aspect of Christianity, which was last week, when we were talking about a whole new development, the Church of the Atheist, which seems to be a a kind of a misnomer, and yet that's exactly what it is because they're looking to be people who do not have a belief in God, but they love all of the aspects of what, well, the church and the faith has to offer. Very interesting group of people. Well, today we're going to switch. We're going to shift to a focus on a new uh, religious tradition, Uh, we are going to be looking at the the growth and the development development of Islam in our world and how this began uh, in the uh, Middle East and has now spread throughout the entire world and some of the aspects of that. Today we're going to have like a kind of an introduction to Islam and then over the next several weeks we're going to be looking at different factions within Islam, different sects within the, the tradition of, of Islam and how they continue to try to follow the traditions of the faith as it was started by Muhammad. And that's what we'll be looking at today is just the origins. So here we go with our slides and we begin with our comparative religion slide, the one you've all been very familiar with and have seen this many times. But today we're going to start with this one. A nice, simple Arab word. Uh, This is a banner that you will find many places, and it simply says, Allah, God. Islam begins, we have to understand, with the aspect of prayer and the understanding of the many names of God. And one of the prayers of Islam is this, in the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate, praise be Allah, creator of the world's The merciful, the compassionate, thee do we worship, thee we do ask for aid. Guide us in the straight path. A very good prayer in the tradition because this is what is being taught in this faith, that there is a certain way to live and a certain straight path that you are to follow, and it is in that process that you find God and you find the real meaning of life. Islam is the second largest religion in the world after Christianity. Right now, there are approximately 1.8 billion Muslims uh, in the world, and they are spread out literally around the globe. Although its roots go back further, scholars typically date the creation of Islam to the 7th century in our common era. Uh, The roots and the traditions of this go back a little bit further, but it really is in this time period that things begin to uh, come together as a new religious uh, expression. Now one of the things we have to understand about Islam, particularly in the Western world, and especially in the United States, Islam is, according to Newsweek magazine, hopelessly, systematically, and stubbornly misunderstood. We never really have tried to understand the traditions. We have systematically looked at this as a very bad uh, religious expression. We have stubbornly misunderstood it, and that has created a lot of our problems in our world in dealing with this. We have to realize that Islam is of the Abrahamic faith. They follow the traditions of Judaism 
and the traditions of Christianity in recognizing that their origin comes from a person known as Abraham. The Abraham that we find in scripture of the book of Genesis and they are following in this very strong tradition as we shall see. With the United States and with Western Europe, Islam shares a common Greek philosophical tradition. The philosophy of the Greek Empire in the, uh, well, basically from the time of Alexander the Great right up through the, the Roman Empire and into the second and third century in the Common Era, Greek philosophy has very, very deeply impacted Western civilization, but it has also impacted the traditions of Islam. We have, whether we like to admit it or not, we have a very real shared cultural and linguistic heritage. We come from a common origin, and we share a lot of the same understandings of the world, and that's what makes this such a rich and wonderful religious tradition. Now, the one thing we have to realize is throughout the Middle East, as well as in other places in the world, historically, Jews, Christians, and Muslims have coexisted peacefully for generations. This has happened in the Middle East. This has happened in Moorish Spain. It has happened in other places in the world. Because of the way in which these three faith traditions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, come together with their common understandings of the world, their common cultural and linguistic understandings, many places in the world, the, um, these faith communities have had to coexist. They've had to depend upon each other for existence. And this has been a part of the history. Of course, the other side of the history is this. Jews, Christians, and Muslims have often been at war with one another. We constantly turn and fight against those who ideas are closest to our own. And that has been one of the problems that is ongoing in our world to this day. Islam comes to us from the Arabic word salam. Compare that to the Hebrew word shalom. It means in Arabic peace, as shalom in Hebrew means peace. It means wholeness. It means completeness. It, in Arabic, salam also means surrender. And this becomes a major aspect of the faith tradition of Islam. Peace comes when you surrender your life to God. It's the only way you'll ever find peace. By having your life completely and totally surrendered to the will of God. Muslim, a person who adheres to Islam. Islam is the peace that comes when your life is surrendered to God. You do that, you are a Muslim, one who adheres to this teaching, this understanding of the world. Within 100 years of its origin, Islam had spread from the Atlantic Ocean to the center of China. A vast empire that assimilated more people than the Greeks or the Romans. The empire of the Islamic tradition covered such a vast area and incorporated more people than anything that the Greeks or Romans had ever attempted to do. And what brought them all together was they were united in a belief in one God. And that becomes crucial. Allah comes from two Arab words, al which is the definite article, the, and la is God. Allah means God. But it's more than that. Literally, Allah means the God. It is not a God. It is the God, the only God. There is none other but this. And of course, our traditions in Judaism and Christianity would both agree with that definition. The understanding that there is only one God, the true God, and we could all say together, the God of Abraham. Now, what happens here is Islam does follow the biblical narrative, particularly the story of creation by God. 
right out of the book of Genesis. It is a part of the understanding of how the world is created, the universe is created, everything that exists is created by God. They point to the stories of the flood and Noah. And particularly in the story of Noah and his descendants, the one person who stands out more than any other is Noah's son, Shem. Now, in the traditions of Islam, the term Semite is descriptive. Like the Jewish people, the Arabs are Semitic people. They all are descendants of Abraham through Shem, which is where the word Semite comes from. Abraham, the descendant of Shem, is extremely important, vitally important to the self-understanding of who the Islamic people are. In the story of Genesis, the one passage that becomes very prominent in the Islamic tradition is Genesis chapter 22. This is, in the Christian tradition, is known as the sacrifice of Isaac. In the tradition of Judaism, this is known as the binding of Isaac. In the story, in Genesis chapter 22, Abraham is called by God to offer up his son as a sacrifice. And the story tells us that they go out to the place where the sacrifice is to take, uh, to occur, which is on Mount Moriah. And Abraham binds up Isaac and places him on the altar and is intending to sacrifice him when the Lord intervenes and provides a ram to be offered for a sacrifice instead of Isaac. A prominent story in the tradition of both Judaism and Christianity. Well, it plays a prominent role in the history and the theology of Islam. Except it is called the submission of Abraham. The focus of the story is on Abraham, not on Isaac. In fact, Isaac doesn't play a part of the story in Islam because they trace it through another, uh, another stream. Islam holds that Ishmael, Abraham's son by Hagar, was the child that was offered up to God. Not Isaac, but Ishmael. Abraham's wife Sarah had driven out Hagar and Ishmael. They come to the town of Mecca, which is in what we call modern-day Saudi Arabia, and it's there that Ishmael becomes the father of the Arab people. The connection, however, is that Ishmael is the son of Abraham. They continue in this tradition of understanding that the faith tradition comes through the Abraham story of Scripture. The descendants of Isaac were the Hebrews. The descendants of Ishmael were the Arabs. And we see two streams, two different groups of people beginning from the same origins. Now we get into the 6th century in the Common Era. And we look at Arabia as it was at that particular point in time. And we discover that it was basically ruled as tribal societies. Little groups of tribal groups that were uh, competing for power and political authority. The Arabian Peninsula has never been known as a very prosperous place. And there always was a sense of scarcity. Living hand to mouth almost on a regular basis. A tremendous amount of political turmoil and a lot of social dysfunction because of drunkenness and gambling and all kinds of licentious behavior that was going on throughout the entire region of Arabia in this 6th century of the Common Era. Animistic polytheism was the rule of the day. There were multitude of gods. Bloodletting and chaos ruled the day as these various tribal societies fought for preeminence. And in the midst of all of this, the, the licentiousness of the society was absolutely horrible. It was that world that Muhammad was born into. Now, in his life, we have to understand that he suffered a great deal of tragedy. Over the course of time, most of the members of his family had died. 
He was described as a very pure-hearted and very sensitive person. He had a profound sense of honor and a really deep sense of caring and compassion and a sense of duty for those who were poor and those who were weak. And these were the things that shaped his life and his thought. As a young man, he was known as the true and the upright. Somebody who had very good qualities in a world that was so chaotic. And because of his pure-heartedness, because of his sensitivity, because of this sense of honor that he carried, he sought solitude and sought to spend his life in a time of reflection. His reflection was based on his searching for God. In his world, there were a multitude of gods, and he began to focus his worship and his meditation on one of the local gods who was known simply as Allah. And that's where he spent his time and his energy. Muhammad saw Allah as the creator, the supreme provider, the one who determines human destiny. And he came up with the expression, there is no God but God. And that begins the formation of his writings in life that become known to us, and we'll see in just a little while, as the Quran. One of the significant events of his life was what was known as the Night of Power. According to tradition, Muhammad was in a cave and was praying in solitude, and he received a commission. And the commission simply was to proclaim, in the name of your Lord who created, created man from a clot of blood, proclaim, your Lord is most generous, who teaches by the pen, teaches man what he knew not. That's a direct quotation from the Quran uh, in one of the chapters. This was the call that he received, the commission that he received, was to go out and to proclaim and teach everyone about the nature of this God that he has encountered, the one God, the only God, Allah. Islam is based on uncompromising monotheism, which was at odds with the rampant polytheism of his day. In this sense, very strictly, this, this unapologetic, this uncompromising monotheism is something that is shared with both Judaism and Christianity. There is one God. There are not other gods. The other gods are false gods. There is only one that matters, and this is the God that is presented in Islam, Allah. Because of the chaos, because of the nature of the culture in which he was growing up in, his teachings had a very strong morality to them, demanded an end to licentiousness. The drunkenness, the gambling, the, the, the human behavior that was going on was just so wrong that they began to stress in the Islamic tradition from the very beginning this strong moral understanding of how we live life. And they began to present a challenge to the social order that demanded that people be treated with justice and with equality. And of course, by presenting these things in the culture in which he was living, Mohammed was faced with open hostility, calling people to live moral lives, calling for justice and equality in society was not really welcomed in his day or in anybody's day. In 622, in the Common Era, uh, he was forced to flee from Mecca he moved to the city of Medina, and he began to rise in political power. He began to have a lot of people following him for his teachings, for the type of life that he was beginning to advocate for, for the lessons he was teaching people that he was selling came to him 
from the revelations that he had from God. There was a period of struggle between Mecca and Medina. And in the end, they went to war and Muhammad was able to defeat the powers in Mecca. And after taking over the city, the inhabitants of the city converted to Islam and Islam began to spread from that point forward. Medina and Mecca still continue to be the most important places in the tradition and the understanding of Islam. In these two towns, Mecca, Medina, this is where Muhammad begins to build his whole base of organization. The, the sites that are located there have become prominent places in the tradition. There's one other that is not mentioned in here, but it was the city of Jerusalem. One night in his dream, he had this understanding of him flying from, uh, from Mecca to the holy city of Jerusalem, where he landed there and was to receive other teachings from, uh, from Allah. And it was in that place where the Al-Aqsa Mosque is now built on Temple Mount in Jerusalem, which now holds that tradition of an important religious and historical site for Judaism, for Christianity, and for Islam, all right there in the same exact spot, which has led to more trouble than any place else on the planet. But Mecca and Medina become very prominent places in this whole tradition. Now, what we have here is a collection of writings called the Quran. Many different ways of spelling it, but it is considered the most important holy book among all of the Muslims. It contains basic information that is found in the Hebrew Bible, as well as revelations that were given to Muhammad by God. The text is considered the sacred word of God, and it supersedes any previous writings. Now, Islam is considered, they consider themselves to be people of the book. And they hold that in common with Judaism and Christianity. And so they can look at and reflect on the teachings of the Torah. They can look at and understand the teachings of the New Testament and the Christian Bible. But in their tradition, it is the Quran that has superseded all of those. And they have a much greater value than the Hebrew text or the Christian text ever will have. Muhammad's scribes wrote down his words, which became the Quran. The reason being is that Muhammad himself never learned how to read or to write. He dictated his teachings and people, his scribes were writing his words down and they became the words of the Quran. The Quran was compiled shortly after he died. And the book is written with Allah as the first person. God speaking through the angel Gabriel to Muhammad to tell him what it was that he was supposed to teach and what people were to learn. The Quran has 114 chapters. They are called surahs. And they in, contain all of the teachings and all of the uh, lessons that Muhammad is trying to pass on to the people who are going to be a part of this faith tradition known as Islam. Now, there are certain aspects of the tradition that are very, very important. And their understanding of God plays a prominent role in everything. Some of the ways that they look at God is that God is infinite. God is omnipotent. God is compassionate. God is merciful. God is peaceful. One of the traditions in Islam is the multiple names of God. And those names are recited over and over again to give you an idea as an individual of just how powerful and how wonderful, how compassionate and how merciful Allah really is. And this is a part of the faith tradition and the worship tradition and the prayer tradition of Islam. Creation. Their understanding of creation shares a lot of what we understand in Western civilization. 
created by the deliberate action of God. Creation was God's idea and God's action and God's plan. God spoke and creation came into being. Now, one of the other aspects is that matter is both real and important. You may remember when we were talking about the um, Church of the New Jerusalem and the teachings of Emanuel Swedenborg, where he was looking at the fact that matter is not real. We talked about the teachings of Mary Baker Eddy and the Church of Christ scientist and the metaphysical understanding that, the, that she was presenting that matter is not real. Matter is a figment of your imagination. Well, in the Islamic tradition, matter is real. This is real stuff. This is what we see and touch and interact with all of the time. And it goes beyond that. All matter created by God, who is good, has an inherent goodness. Paraphrase the book of Genesis. God saw everything that God had made and declared that it was very good, exceedingly good. There's an inherent goodness in all of creation. There's an inherent goodness in you, in me, in all of us. And because matter is real, because it is something that God has created, it set the stage for the Islamic world to be deeply involved in Scientific exploration and discovery. From the very origins of this faith tradition, scientific exploration and discovery were vitally important. In the Dark Ages, or as we call them, the, the Middle Ages in Europe, society was basically illiterate, without much understanding of anything that was going on. In the Islamic tradition, scientific discovery was everywhere. What we know about the sciences comes to us from the things that were learned by the Islamic tradition in the 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th centuries. The development of the understanding of medicine was so far advanced in the Islamic world. The understanding of mathematics. Do you remember in school studying that one Arabic concept, algebra? Algebra, created by the scientific and mathematical discoveries of the Islamic world. And the traditions go on way beyond that. Here's an understanding of the human self. The foremost of God's creation, the pinnacle of God's creation. The understanding that comes to us from the book of Genesis is what the Islamic tradition is looking at. The creation of everything but the pinnacle of creation is the creation of God's foremost preeminent part of that act, the creation of human beings. Now they have an understanding here that is different from our Western understanding of the world because we hold on to this kind of sense of the, uh, the fall or what we call original sin. But in the Islamic tradition, humanity is not stained by the catastrophic fall. And we do not have original sin. We are, according to the teachings in the Quran, we human beings are unalterably good. Gaflal. Forgetting our divine origin is what happens. We forget who we are. We forget that we belong to God. We do things that are not following the teachings of God, and therefore we need constant reminder and constant correction. And this is where the Quran becomes the guidebook for how we live our lives. But remember one thing. The human being, the human self, is the foremost of God's creation, and we are unalterably good. So what do we do then? The human self is created in such a way that their life is supposed to be a reflection of gratitude. Thanksgiving for the life that you have received. Gratitude for God, which then shapes you in such a way that you are thankful to God and caring towards other people. 
you enjoy the blessings of God, and you work to make life better for everyone. An infidel is one who lacks thankfulness. Anybody can be grateful. Anyone can be filled with gratitude. But what about somebody who does not reflect gratitude, does not have a sense of thankfulness in their life? The term in Islam is infidel. The human self, this is who we are. This is what we are created to do. We are created to surrender. Islam comes from the Arab word salam, which means peace, wholeness, but it means surrender. A wholehearted giving of oneself. Give oneself as a slave to God is to free oneself from other forms of slavery. If you are committed to God, you cannot be a slave to anything else. Surrender becomes the mark of commitment. Do you remember the story of Abraham? In the Islamic tradition, the understanding is all about Abraham's surrender. God comes to Abraham in his town of Ur of the Chaldees and says, go. And Abraham goes. He is told that he is going to be the father of a multitude. And Abraham believes. He is told to take his son, his only son, Ishmael, and offer him as a sacrifice. And Abraham takes his son, his only son, the son he loves, Ishmael, according to the Islamic tradition, and takes to prepare him as a sacrifice. But God intervenes. But the story is not about Ishmael. It's not about Isaac. The story is about Abraham surrendering his life so that he may be a slave to God. A wholehearted giving of oneself, trusting in the providence of God. So we have core beliefs. The very big, important aspects of this tradition and how they work this out in life. There is one God, there is no other God, the only God is Allah. That is it. Anything else is wrong. Muhammad is considered to be the greatest prophet. There are other prophets, Abraham, Moses, prophets of the uh, Hebrew scriptures, prophets of the New Testament in the Christian scriptures. Jesus, all are considered prophets and are honored but Muhammad is the last and the most important. It is through Muhammad, his words in the book of the Quran, that are the teachings, the final teachings of God. And this is the place where we find what it is that we are supposed to do in our lives. There are other aspects to the tradition that become very important. Fasting. The month of Ramadan is a time period where all good, able-bodied Muslims refrain from eating during daylight hours as a way of focusing on spiritual discipline. Many traditions around the world understand fasting as a way of spiritually focusing your life on the reality of God and your calling as a believer. In Islam, fasting is a very important thing. If you have illnesses, for example, if you are a diabetic, you are excused from fasting during that time period, but it is something that is very important. Charity is extremely important. Mohammed, as this young man, has a deep sensitivity and concern for the poor and the suffering. And he recognizes that as human beings, if we are truly sacrificing ourselves, if we are truly surrendering ourselves to God, then we have to be deeply concerned for all of God's creation, including other people. Charity becomes important because no matter how bad off your situation is right now, there is somebody who is much worse off than you are. And you have an obligation to care for them, to provide for them, 
to give of your substance for the needs of others. Charity is very, very important. A life of prayer is also important. So much so that prayer is to be done five times a day. There are prescribed prayers to be prayed at prescribed times during the day, and every good Muslim will engage in that type of prayer as a part of their faith tradition. At least one time in life, every able-bodied Muslim is required to make a pilgrimage, what is called the Hajj, to the holy city of Mecca. It is to go there to go through a pilgrimage journey to deepen your faith and your commitment to the teachings of Islam, to the teachings of the Quran, and learning how to live your life as one who has surrendered all to Allah. This year, the pilgrimage is being strictly limited because of the COVID virus. And this is creating an issue in Islam at this particular time. But the concern is by having mass gatherings, uh, as they have had in the past, it could lead to serious complications. But the requirement is still there. If you are an able-bodied Muslim, at least one time in your life, you have to make this hajj, the pilgrimage to the city of Mecca. There is also a very strong belief in Judgment Day, and in certain manners here, we share this thing in common between Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. We look at it in different ways. We have different emphases on this, but the understanding simply is that Allah watches over everything. And at some indeterminate point in time in the future, what is going to be called Judgment Day, every human being is going to be judged on how they live their life. In Islam, the tradition is if you have been a person who has followed the Quran, you have obeyed the teachings of God, you have surrendered your life to God, you have followed everything that you're supposed to do, then you are rewarded with eternal life in paradise. On the other hand, if you have not followed the teachings of the Quran and not followed the teachings of God and have lived your life in a way that is not holy, what is waiting for you is eternal damnation. And Judgment Day plays a very prominent role in the teaching of the Islamic tradition. These are the core beliefs of the faith and they get carried out in the practice of people from around the world all of the time. There's one other aspect, one other tradition that is a part of the core beliefs of Islam and is one that has also been very deeply under, misunderstood. And it is the word jihad. We have all heard this term. It has played a prominent role in our history, in our world, for at least the last 25, 30 years, if not more. And uh, we know very well what it means, except, well, we actually misunderstand it very seriously. The central idea in Islam is jihad, which means struggle. The term has been used negatively in our mainstream culture. But Muslims believe it refers to the internal and external efforts to defend their faith. Hmm. How do we try to understand this? The struggle is simply this. You know how God wants you to live. Let's look at it from our perspective as either uh, members of Judaism or Christianity. We can share something in common that is very, very easy, the Ten Commandments. We know what the Ten Commandments are. We know we're supposed to follow them. You shall not steal. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward, isn't it? Did you ever rob a bank? Probably not. Did you ever steal something like You know, you're at work and you take home some pens or you take home some paper or you take home some envelopes or you borrow some stamps or something along. Did that ever happen? Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> and that does, right? Ah, the struggle that we have is that we're supposed to live within the confines of what goes on. Look at it this way. Thou shalt not kill. Now, I know, well, maybe I shouldn't say that. I don't think anybody here at Rattle Park has killed anybody today. Have you? You haven't done that at all, have you? You haven't gone out and committed murder. We know that killing is wrong, right? Ah, yes, but one of the, the rabbis, one of the, the traditions of our faith background was this understanding if you even say something bad about your neighbor you have already committed murder in your heart if you ever say so much as you fool you've already committed murder in your have you ever committed murder no but have you ever done anything that could be very harmful or hurtful to somebody. This is the struggle that we're talking about. In order to live as a good Muslim, you have to surrender yourself completely to God and follow all of the teachings of God. You have to keep, well, if we can put it in the context of Judaism, you have to keep Torah. You have to keep the traditions of Christianity that incorporate all of the teachings of the Torah and the Ten Commandments and the extra teachings that have come to us from Jesus and the Apostle Paul and other leaders of the early church about how we're supposed to live our lives. Have we ever done that? We struggle with it all of the time. This is what jihad means in Islam. It is the individual struggle to try to live up to the way you're supposed to live and at the same time to be able to defend your faith, your belief, and your traditions to a world that does not believe. Sounds pretty similar to a lot of Christianity and a lot of Judaism. However, there is one aspect of jihad that has gotten blown out of proportion in our world, and that's why we use this very negatively in our mainstream culture. In the tradition of Islam, this is a very rare occurrence, but there can be the justification for military jihad in case a just war is needed. That definition is something that has come to play havoc in our world in recent years. But these are the core traditions of Islam. Again, going back to take a look at those. The one God known as Allah. Muhammad the prophet, the greatest prophet, the last prophet whose teachings are in the Quran. We have to know them, we have to believe them, we have to follow them. Fasting, charity, prayer, the pilgrimage, or what is known as the Hajj, Judgment Day, and Jihad. The struggle of how to live as we are supposed to. These begin to frame the understanding of this whole concept of Islam. Now, going forward, we're going to take a look at several of the different groupings inside of Islam and how they have carried out their traditions and their lives. So next week, when we come back together again, we're going to be looking at the traditions of Sunni Muslims, and they are probably the largest group uh, at work in the world, uh, the most prominent ones, uh, and we're going to look at their traditions, their practices that they have. So that'll be it for us for today, and we'll pick up with the Sunni Islam next week. Hope you have a wonderful afternoon, and enjoy.